Welcome everyone to the book chat. Uh, my name is Laura Cavers and book chat is uh, our monthly book recommendation uh, program. Today, we are very, very happy to have as Kirk Walsh. She has written the book Elephant of Belfast, which is a wonderful historical novel uh, about uh, World War II and the bombing of Belfast and a young girl and an elephant, which um, it's very dear and sweet. So um, welcome, Kirk. <laughs> yeah, S Thank Kirk. you. So I'm curious, what is S if you don't mind? Yeah, it's funny. Um, it actually speaks to the story a little bit. So my first name is Sheila and um, my middle name's Kirk, which is a family name. And I actually, I went to, I'm from originally Michigan, but I went to school in upstate New York, St. Lawrence. Actually, a lot of my um, St. Lawrence, yeah, uh, school or classmates were from Connecticut and New Jersey, and oh. uh, they started calling me Kirk, and it stuck. Oh. But um, the elephant in the true story um, that inspired my novel, her name was Sheila. So that kind of um, created yes. a connection when I first heard about the story. Oh, nice, nice. So just a little, I'm going to mute everyone. Um, and Kirk, you're going to have to unmute yourself because my button's going to mute everyone. Um, and, uh, but um, I just wanted to let people know if you, um, we sh Kirk has a little uh, uh, view um, thing that she has. Oh, let me make sure I've got everyone. Um, up on your right hand corner to make sure that you get to see the slideshow that she has prepared for us today. Um, there is over on the right hand side of your top corner. If you just bring your cursor up, you'll see that you have different views. And we're going to do the speaker view. If you could click on that, that way you'll have a larger screen and you'll be able to see her, her uh, slideshow. And um, I just wanna do a brief in, um, introduction uh, Kirk is a writer, she's an editor, and she's a teacher. She also writes book reviews. She lives in Austin, Texas, as she had said before, and Elephants in Belfast is her first novel. So thank you, Kirk, very much for being with us. And I wanted to, you know, how did you find out about this incident? Was it um, you know, you just came across it, or were you searching for a World War II story? There are so many people who love World War II stories. Yeah, so, um, yeah, actually, well, when I, we get to the slides, I have the image of the story, but um, I heard about it on the radio, a story about the elephant angel, and her identity was discovered in 2009, um, because they didn't know who she was. Uh, her name's Denise Austin, and you know, quickly her cousin called when they were circulating these photos of um, Denise and Sheila the elephant. And what happened was there were um, radio stations all over the world broadcasted a story of a woman giving shelter to an elephant when the Germans bombed Belfast in the summer of 1941. And yet, to be honest, I wasn't looking for World War II. I wasn't looking for an elephant. Um, I am from a family that heavily identifies as Irish Catholic. So I was very interested in Ireland. Um, you know, obviously Northern Ireland is a more complicated place, but that's kind of what drew me in. Um, but it, yeah, was a process because I didn't sort of set out to write World War II, um, but I recognized right away that when I mentioned this incident, many people didn't know that Belfast had been bombed because Ireland was neutral. And so there was just an assumption that Belfast too was neutral despite being, you know, British. So um, I saw a gap and that's what sort of um, led me into the story. Well, uh, the cover of your book is what led me to your book uh, uh -huh. because yes, I, I like you, I didn't, I didn't know that Belfast was got bombed or that it had been pulled into the war or anything like that. And seeing the cover, I'm like, 
that looks kind of bombed area, but there's an elephant and a young lady walking. I'm just like, oh my gosh, what is this story about? So it made me pull it off the shelf, you know, turn it over and start to read it. And I'm like, oh, wow. So yeah, I think that that is a fascinating part of the story. I think also what I love about your story is, you know, just we know zoos of today and sort of zoos of my childhood and all of that. But but there, you also go into the zoo, the, the people who bring the zoo animals to the zoo and those mm -hmm. kinds of people and, and also the zoo keepers and also the zoo helpers and all that it takes to take care of a zoo. Is that mm -hmm. something you had to do a lot of research on? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I was really fortunate. Um, and there are a few pictures of people who helped me um, in the slideshow, but uh, the Houston Zoo has a very large um, Asian elephant family. Uh, it, uh, as probably readers know, elephants are actually being phased out of zoos, um, that the zoos don't have large enough spaces for the elephants to be in a healthy environment. Um, Houston has been able to create a pretty large space for the elephants. And so um, they, yeah, had two three-year-old elephants when I was doing my research and that was the age of the elephant in the story and um but I did rely on also the zookeeper in Belfast uh Raymond Robinson and then I also read um you know Barbara King who's kind of a famous animal expert mm -hmm. um Carl Sarfina um wrote a book about animals and kind of their emotional life. So I, I did do a lot of research and I did my best to animate, you know, the world of the zoo. I mean, I am an animal person, um, but you know, it it was very, most of the book takes place at the zoo. And so yeah. I really wanted that to come to life for the reader. And I, um, yeah, and I am kind of a writer who, um, built a world through details as you probably experienced in um, so it's just a part of my process. And just to let people know there is you know a, a girl falling in love and then um, gets gets sort of you know has all the love problems that a young girl mm -hmm. faces all during a war and bombing and all that sort of thing. Um, there's also a mom and daughter story it's not all about an elephant and a zoo. And I mean, it, it, you really mm -hmm. capture the neighborhoods, you capture, um, you know, what other people are experiencing in the neighborhood. And, um, you know, so I, I think that it, it really does deliver a lot about Belfast at the time um, and the people there. So I'm going to now, uh, I'm gonna do this screen share. Um, okay. Kirk and I were having some trouble, technical difficulties a little while ago, but let's fingers crossed and I will be able to share this with you. And there we are. And so now I've got to make it be. Yeah. If you click on slideshow up there at the top. Oh, you know what? I have a screen covering that. There we go. Okay. Slideshow. There we are. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, so uh, if we just want to move to the next slide. Um, so this is the image. This is Denise Austin and her mother and the elephant Sheila. And this is the image that kind of circulated widely around the world in 2009. Um, as I said, I heard the story on the radio. Um, I was driving between Austin and San Antonio. I thought this would make a good novel. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, I would say several years later that I began to pursue it. Um, but it, yeah, I just sort of put it in my back pocket because like I said, it presented a gap in kind of our, um, the World War II history. So if you want to go to the next one. Um, as I said, I come from, this is my dad, my uncle Kirk, who I, um, he's my namesake and my aunt Mariana. And these are my um, Irish, <laughs> <laughs> You know, people that um, my uncle and my dad uh, just really, um, you know, Ireland is very important to them. And so even though I was writing about Northern Ireland, um, I felt a pretty strong connection to my Irish Catholicism um, throughout this process, which was a really um, wonderful part 
of the writing and researching, if you want to go to the next one. Um, and so the, one of the ways, I, you know, with story um, and historical fiction, it's like a balance of adhering to the truth and invention and imagination. And so for me, a big part of the process, I had kind of this story of a young female zookeeper. She is the first female zookeeper at the Belfast Zoo and the Germans bombing and her taking care of this elephant to, you know, the story itself is true in terms of um, what happens to the animals. Um, and, but I had to develop Hetty's character and I did draw, so this is um, my great uncle, Bernard Kirk, and he was a uh, all American football player for the University of Michigan. And this is my grandmother, um, uh, Helen Kirk Wright. And my uncle, great uncle died in a car accident tragically when he was 20 um, and my grandmother was 19. And so she really was my kind of audience of one when I first started writing because I wanted to try to understand how she survived um, such a tragic loss at a young age. So if you wanna go next. <laughs> and so I, I did go to Belfast, but before I traveled to Belfast, I wanted to write a first draft. So like I said, I would have the story in my imagination before I saw the actual place. You know, I did have to build the world as much as I could. I, I, I did do a lot of revision. So it was a lot of research, revision, research, revision, research, mm -hmm. revision. Um, this image is of, this isn't Sheila, this is Daisy, which is an elephant that preceded her. Um, but she did arrive by steamship and she was so kind of nervous they had to walk her up the Antrim Road. And so this is an image, I will say, I, um, it lived on my desktop for many years. So I would say out of all the images I'm going to be showing you, this is the one that defined my writing process the most. And I did show this uh, image to the zookeeper at the Houston Zoo just to get his impression. And he said, um, you know, it looks like the elephant is leading the young men rather than the young men leading the elephant. Um, and the one young man to uh, one with the cane. Um, so he's a uh, 16 years old. And one of the great things about um, publishing the book is meeting readers and spontaneous connections. And so his daughter reached out to me. Um, the book was published in Australia and um, he was a zookeeper and mm -hmm. she spent a lot of time at the zoo. And so it was kind of amazing to connect with someone around this image. If you wanna to go to the next one. Um, and, oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, yeah, totally. I just wanted to- um, Let's see if I can go back. Yeah. Oh no, it's, it's making me go forward. Oh, can you click back? I'm trying, let's see, back. There we go. Yeah. So, so sorry. Just, that's okay. Um, This just shows, so the reason the Germans bombed Belfast was be, it was a producer of arsenal for the British. Uh, the shipbuilding port is really, um, the, the Titanic was built there in the early 1900s, but they were producing a lot of tanks and submarines and ships for the Royal Navy and Royal Army. And so um, the zoo, all the geography adheres to real life. Um, it is about six miles up from downtown um, but that was the reason the Germans flew up. And once they occupied France, they were able to fly um, up to uh, Belfast. And, you know, the people of Belfast, they just didn't think the Germans really knew what was going on there. So they just didn't think um, they would come up. If you want to go to the next one. So this is Sheila um, and uh, Dick Foster, who was the head zookeeper. And he inspired my character, Mr. Wright. And um, yeah, you know, this was once again an image I um, looked at, but not quite as much as the other one. Uh, if you want to go to the next image. Um, so this is Sheila once again. This image did inspire some scenes um, with her young admirers. And, you know, once again, I showed this to uh, the large mammal curator at the Houston Zoo. And he said, you know, you'll notice that her skin is loose, um, how it hangs. And he said, it's most likely this photo was taken 
um, around World War II because of the rationings. She's clearly underfed um, because her skin is so loose. But this was an image um, I definitely drew on to develop Violet's character. You wanna go next? So I actually don't know if this is Sheila or not. Um, it might be Tina, another elephant that showed up. And this uh, image, I don't know who the zookeeper is, but he was the inspiration for Ferris Poole, who is, uh, works with Teddy and kind of mentors her as well as Mr. Wright. The next one. And this is an image from the Belfast Telegraph. Um, I didn't write a scene exactly inspired from this um, of a young woman playing music in the streets to soldiers, but it did inspire me um, to bring music into the book. I really wanted, I, I just was thinking about ways like lights and shadow, you know, I needed to find ways to bring joy into the book because there's so much devastation and this photo inspired me with the music that kind of shows up in different scenes. Next. And then these are young kids being evacuated um, before the bombings. And, um, you know, I don't have an exact scene of children evacuating. It is mentioned, but uh, this image and some other images inspired having children, the neighborhood kids um, in the narrative, because once again, I felt like I needed to find ways to bring innocence and kind of levity uh, to the narrative um, so that there was a little balance and complexity to everything that was happening. Um, so. so a part of my process, like I said, um, I, I wanted to write a draft before I went to Belfast and I did do a lot of reading and um, collecting of details. And I'm kind of doing this right now for my next book where um, I come up with these different categories of like daily life and um, religion, food, transportation. Um, and so for Elephant of Belfast, I built like a 20 page, 25 page document that I could just kind of keep next to my computer if I was writing a reference. Because really as a fiction writer, um, I need to know enough so I, I can describe my characters moving through the world. You know, whether it's a room, or on the streets of Belfast. And so this book gave me just enough information um, to kind of begin that process of writing scenes. Um, next. So um, they go to Belfast summer of 2013. Um, and uh, before I went, I did reach out to the Northern Ireland War Memorial and they were my resource for um, connecting to Belfast Blitz survivors, which was integral to my research. Um, but I did reach out to the Belfast Zoo, and if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, so the first person I interviewed was David Ramsey. He's Denise Austin's second cousin and last living relative, and also a lawyer. Um, so I just wanted to tell him what I was up to, um, that I was writing a historical novel, um, I was going to change his cousin's name and I was going to make stuff up and if he was okay with that and he said yes. So I, I felt good that I got the families, you know, he just out of respect and um, but he did actually he's a bit younger than Denise and um, he did actually ride the elephant um, that on the street and that informed if you read the book kind of some of the later scenes and you know he described the locomotion you know how it was different than riding a horse mm -hmm. and also um yeah Denise Austin didn't really this was kind of the most monumental thing that happened in their life um her parents were invalids and she had to take care of them and so I kind of knew um there was going to be a fair amount of work of developing her character and kind of you know, creating complexity. Um, and that would be a part of the fiction. So the next slide. So this is Vance Rogers. Um, he was 17 at the time of the Blitz and he was a fire watcher downtown. And um, he was 90 when I interviewed him in his living room. And I, I will say this was the moment where I was like, yes, I can write this book because the way I found my way in 
to the Blitz was um, the scope was quite similar to September 11th. And at the time of the attacks, I lived in Manhattan and had a fair amount of firsthand experience of what it was like uh, to live in a place that was um, attacked and, you know, just the smell of burning in the air, the transformation of public spaces, um, you know, a public city bus becoming an emergency vehicle, um, the missing kind of flyers that showed up on the walls of banks. Um, and so it was really important to me, um, I mean, to meet someone who survived the blitz, she since passed away, but I felt like um, it was a moment where I recognized that I could honor their stories. Um, and so, um, you know, the internet is great and everything, but there's nothing quite like doing things in person for that kind of experience. And he, this interview and the other blitz interviews I did, you know, this book took me a long time to write um, and I encountered a fair amount of rejection along the way. And I felt inspired to keep going because they shared their stories with me. So next image. So these are the original newspapers of the Belfast Telegraph at the Northern, Northern Ireland War Memorial. And once again, I mean, I could collect a lot of these details on the internet, um, but it was just amazing to be able to read the original newspaper that was published days following the Blitz. And, you know, my computer's right there and I had to wear those rubber gloves, um, but it was, you know, I'll never forget it. And it really helped um, with kind of the details, uh, particularly following the Easter Tuesday bombings, which, um, you know, I was looking at my calendar and actually Easter Tuesday, uh, the anniversary, um, it's tomorrow. So it was 81 years ago tomorrow um, that the Easter Tuesday bombings happened. So. Uh, next slide. And this is St. George's, which figures into the book. Um, you know, like I mentioned, it was a public space uh, market that is transformed into a morgue after the bombings. And um, yeah, it was really um, moving to be able to go inside. And, um, you know, my, my book was written unfortunately kind of into the pandemic and so when it first the pandemic first started and hit me York so hard and um I don't know there just felt like there was resonance um with St. George's and um but I I one thing that as a writer um I knew I wanted to have set pieces you know kind of locations that were going to figure largely and it was St. George's the zoo and there's another building I'll show you um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, this is actually Raymond Robinson um, and Alan Karen. So these are the zookeepers at the Belfast Zoo. Um, and they spent a couple of days with me. And Raymond is kind of the informal historian. And he read my manuscript for me. He is one of the people that really helped me, you know, just making sure that I was <laughs> feeding the right vegetables that might be available during the war to the animals, you know, just helping me with some of the details. I want to go to the next. And this is uh, the Grand Staircase. Um, so the old zoo exists below the new zoo. And so it's all overgrown. Um, and so Raymond took my husband and I uh, down to the old zoo. And this was just amazing to see firsthand. If you want to go to the next one. Uh, this is uh, where Dick Foster lived. So this is Mr. Wright's house. If you want to go to the next one. Mm -hmm. This is the elephant house. Um, you know, clearly, mm -hmm. yeah, overgrown. Um, if you go to the next slide. And this is inside. So this goes out to the enclosure where the moat is. Um, and yeah, once again, it was just you know, kind of sad to see it so run down, but also really helpful to see. Next slide. And my husband, my research assistant and driver. <laughs> yeah, I'm dyslexic, so I don't know if I could have handled driving on the wrong side of the road. Um, <laughs> the next slide. And this is the floral hall. So um, this is another one of the sad pieces. Um, I knew I wanted, you know, just, this uh, does um, exist on 
the zoo property. Um, unfortunately, it's in disrepair now. Um, but I just thought because of the music and dancing, you know, it was a place um, where I could have a before and after. Um, and so like St. George's, and this was kind of another set piece in the book. Next slide. And this is Celia Murphy. Um, so she was an Irish singer and she did sing through the night of the Easter Tuesday bombings, but it was down at the Ulster Hall, which is in downtown Belfast. Um, so uh, if you've read the book, you'll know I, it happens at the Floral Hall just because um, I wanted to have my character experience it. And that was sort of, that's like, um, you know, that kind of change, you know, I wasn't changing history too much. Um, you know, you can't change the larger context of history, but you know, with these smaller details, um, I was able to embellish just to sort of uh, help build the story. And next slide. And this is just the northern coastline. Um, I don't really leave Belfast during the book, but this landscape I felt very connected to um, because of my Irish roots. Next slide. Mm. And this is also the coastline, which reminded me a lot of Ireland. Um, next slide. And my husband, um, you know, we did a lot of walking up there and it really um, was quite moving to spend time there, so next. So I did go to the Houston Zoo when I got home. I was like, now I need to learn about elephants. And so this is Tupelo, um, the, she was three um, when I went to the, to the Houston Zoo in uh, um, August, 2013, uh, next slide. And this is just, you know, carrots and potatoes, they're feeding the elephants, next slide. And this is, so I was really lucky. Um, they let me wash the elephant, uh, Tupelo. Um, there's two zookeepers on the other side. I don't think they'd let me do this today. I think the laws have changed or regulations, but it was really amazing to have the firsthand experience of washing an elephant, just her size and weight, kind of to feel kind of the spring of the hairs against my hand as I was washing her. Um, and I just felt so incredibly grateful that they let me do this next. Um, and then this is Tess Tupelo's mom. And uh, I did not wash her, she's a little too big, but they did have to give her an ultrasound and um, uh, up that ultrasound. Um, so I'll just say it was a very messy operation. It involved four or five zookeepers because I had to clean her out. Um, an elephant's skin is too thick to do an x-ray through the skin. And so the chief veterinarian had to go through her rectum and it was messy. And um, I felt like even though there weren't ultrasounds in 1941, just watching the team of zookeepers um, take care of the elephant and treat her with such respect, I felt like it gave me a lot of information about the relationship between an elephant and a zookeeper. Uh, next. So this is Winnie. Um, so by the time my book was published, Tupelo had had a baby of her own. Um, so it was just kind of fun to see. Um, yeah, I wrote an essay about the elephants and it was just kind of a coincidence that the baby was born a month before my book came out. Uh, next. And I just kept doing research and I will say kind of the thing, um, yeah, I did more phone interviews. I spend a lot of time at the New York Public Library um, being a former New Yorker. I love the library on 42nd Street. You know, I was able to read notes of the mass observation. Um, you wanna go to the next slide. Um, mm. There were photos, archival photos from the Belfast Telegraph available at the New York Public Library. Next image. This is also from the Belfast Telegraph um, after the bombing, the next photo. These are original maps from the 1930s of Belfast. And, you know, this didn't so inform the writing, but it, it's, as I'm sure some of you have been in the New York Public Library, it's an amazing place and just to work in there um, was wonderful. Uh, next image. 
Um, and so this, this is Brian Barton. He's the foremost historian of the Blitz and he lives in Belfast. Um, and this is his book, which I read a couple of times. But um, one thing that I discovered when I was in Belfast was um, people did not want to talk about the Catholic Protestant conflict. They just said, you know, it wasn't going on. Um, and Brian really helped me understand the nuances of the conflict. And um, I did not want to embellish it. You know, I wanted to be accurate. And he really helped me with the language. Um, I, a lot of the conflict kind of comes out through dialogue. Um, and I just, I don't know, I'm incredibly grateful to him. He kind of was my teacher in a way. And to kind of have that kind of collaboration, um, I think is one of the gifts of writing historical fiction. So, yeah, and these are just, I wrote many drafts, um, 15 or 16, um, it just took a while. And these are just some of the themes that came up, um, you know, the intersection of private and public grief, you know, how life changes during wartime and crisis um, and uh, being an orphan and, the comfort of ritual and the power of knowledge. That's something my grandmother used to say to me and something I tried to imbue the character of Hetty with those kind of values. Next. And then writing wise, um, you know, all writers kind of have different quotes you kind of put up on your computer or on your wall to kind of keep you little cheerleaders, I guess, or compasses. And, um, you know, I'm not alone in my adoration of Virginia Woolf. Most writers love Virginia Woolf, but um, she wrote when she's writing Mrs. Dalloway, um, I dig out beautiful caves behind my character. I think that gives exactly what I want, humanity, humor, depth. The idea is that the caves shall connect and each comes to daylight at the present moment. Um, and so I was looking for the daylight and the connection between my characters. And then George Saunders, as some of you might know, he's really into the Russians and Chekhov. And um, he talks about this idea of preparing us for tenderness and that the intention of the writer is to crack life open for just a second. And that was definitely kind of what I was trying to do um, when I was writing. Next slide. And lastly, um, these are just a few. Uh, yeah, I know we'll be talking about probably some more current books um, in the recommendations, but these are some books, mostly historical fiction that inspired me. Um, I'll be honest, like I wasn't a huge reader of historical fiction before I wrote this book. Um, I, I am a book reviewer. I review a lot of contemporary fiction, um, but I love like a compact historical novel um, like Buddha in the Attic by Julia Zucca, uh, Train Dreams by Dennis Johnson, um, I, Colvin Toyman is probably one of my favorite living writers. E.L. Doctorow, I was lucky enough, um, he was my professor at NYU. Um, and uh, Book of Daniel is actually a novel told from the point of view of the son of the Rosenbergs who were executed uh, for being communist. Um, and so I just, um, yeah, I just wanted to show you a few books that kind of um, you know, I think for me, the book, um, it's a narrow, I, I came up with narrative constraints. I didn't want it to be an epic narrative because I thought it would be too overwhelming. So I just have one point of view. It covers eight or nine months. Um, you know, I kept it pretty simple just so that I knew it was a lot to write about Belfast uh, during World War II. So I didn't want to make it harder on myself. Um, so next, um, and then these last few slides are just the covers. So as you saw, um, the US cover, um, this is pretty much what my publisher gave me. The only thing that was different was um, the letters were orange in the original. And um, I, some of you might know, there's an organization called the Orange Order, and they're a Protestant group that goes through Catholic neighborhoods and are, can be somewhat antagonistic. And um, so it's just like, yeah, we can't have orange and the word Belfast on the cover. So they changed it to yellow and um, it worked out great. My book came out last year during the pandemic and this reads very well as a one inch thumbnail. 
um, the zookeeper of Belfast is the UK cover. Um, and they wanted to change the title because they felt like people want to read about a person rather than an animal. So I was just like, all right. Um, and they kind of, Australians, I guess, are kind of wild for World War II literature. So they kind of have this triptych design. Um, but you'll notice, actually, on the US cover, um, it's not the right elephant. It's an African elephant. Um, I asked them if they could change it, and they said no. But <laughs> the UK cover has the right elephant. If you go to the next one, um, this is uh, the Norwegian cover, which um, you know has more of the bombed out um, cityscape, mm -hmm. but um, the elephant is a little big. That's okay. Um, and next, lastly, um, so this is actually the Iranian cover. Um, it was published in Iran. And um, so a little bit more abstract, um, but also I think compelling. And that's it. So I can take any other questions. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Here, I'm going to stop the share and come back to everyone. Thank you so much for organizing that slideshow. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think that was great. I, I wrote down many of the books. Uh, so just for everyone to know, um, at the end of this uh, program, what I do is I create an, uh, an after notes newsletter and I send it out to everyone who has registered. And I'll include these, um, I can't include the slideshow into the, but I could include at least that book list that you had uh, inspired you regarding your writing styles and things like that. Um, I have some questions about uh, some of the things, and then we'll open it up to other people. Oh, oh, uh, it, we'll do that, and then we'll do our book recommendations. So, um, so you said it took a long time to write the book. How long was it? It took about six years. Um, and I I've think heard it was, seven. I've heard eight from other writers. So yeah, I mean, it was kind of finding my way in. Um, I did write pretty close to history, and I think I had to learn a lot to trust my imagination because. Um, kind of once uh, Violet and Hetty are together, um, that's where I made up a lot around the chase of the elephant. And I think I just had to get comfortable in the material. And then um, a year or so was added um, because I had an agent and she wasn't really supportive of the book. And so I left her and tried to get a new agent um, for a year with the book, did not, oh, wow. and I sold it on my own. So. Okay. Ah, yeah. That's hard to do. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and then <laughs> over the time frame of the Belfast bombings, how many bombings happened? So there were three, um, and I just include two in the book. The third one was on May 5th. It's called the Fireside Bombings, but the Easter Tuesday bombing was kind of the center, you know, the most devastating and um, kind of reflected, you know, about a thousand people died, kind of similar <laughs> to what happened in Lower Manhattan. And um, yeah, it it's funny, the only other novel about the Belfast Blitz right now was um, written by the Irish writer Brian Moore. It's called The Emperor of Ice Cream. And he too only included the first two bombings. So I, I know for me, I just couldn't imagine putting my character through another set of bombings after everything that happens. And um, it just felt like too much. So I, I didn't include it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also was amazed by you being in the Houston Zoo, washing an elephant mm -hmm. and, and getting that close to an elephant. And mm -hmm. certainly throughout your book, there is this bond that elephants want. Um, and so the elephant bonded with your character. When you were washing the elephant, did you feel that they're that they really are very social, wanting yeah, to bond yeah. animals? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, they're very smart and very interactive. And I didn't have it. You know, I had that one experience, but the zookeepers did do a lot with the elephants around their training and it was clear to me they had very close bonds with the elephant and you know the younger elephant there was another one called Baylor and um yeah they 
kind of the way the Houston Zoo works. There's the Baylor School of Veterinary Medicine. And so a lot of what they're doing at the zoo is providing um, information and research for Baylor and kind of trying to help elephants in the wild. So oh, that's interesting, fascinating. Well, I'm going to open this up. I think what we'll do is questions to uh, Kirk from the audience. And then um, maybe about, I don't know, five minutes prior to the end of weekend or 10 minutes, we can just do some book recommendations. So um, if any of you have questions, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. And if you don't want to do that, you can put it into the chat and I'll be happy to read it to um, S. Kirk, if anyone has any questions about the Belfast bombings or about her writing style or her, or what is her next book or something like that. Any questions? Quiet crew today? I guess so. Well, I hope you guys, I tried to get a copy of the book to show you the cover, uh, but they're all checked out at the library. So um, I wasn't able to show you, but there it is right there. We have copies, just put it on hold. Um, so I'm, uh, what, oh, yes. Um, this is Mary Condon. Oh, yeah. I really enjoyed your pr uh, presentation, Kirk. I've been to Westport, but I'm from, I mean, uh, Belfast, but I'm from Cork actually. Oh. And I was wondering just, I know it's done, it's a, a whole different thing, but I was wondering if you saw the current movie, that love story to Belfast by uh, yeah. Uh, Kenna 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 Kenna. Kenna. Yeah. yeah, no, I have seen it and um, I think it's, it's been, been really recommended. Yeah, no, I think um, the movie obviously, I don't know, it's just been helpful, I think, in terms of having Belfast be a little bit more in people's consciousness. Um, as Definitely. some people might know, um, I mean, this is a little bit before the movie Belfast, but Game of Thrones was shot at, in the sh shipyards. Um, so actually when my husband and I went to Belfast, uh, we got to go into the studios. Um, and it was for me really helpful just to be in the shipyards, um, but my husband did get to sit in the throne. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. Well, um, Kirk, would you like to show the books that um, you are recommending? Yeah, so I have a couple. Um, so this one actually came out this week. Um, it's called Country of Origin. It's by an Egyptian American writer, Dahlia Azim. And it does cover multiple generations um, and kind of, and between Cairo and the states and sort of the impacts of um, the revolution, but also, um, yeah, just the, I, she kind of, I, I think it's the first time I've read an immigrant novel that more examined the mental illness that might come out of that kind of trauma of loss. So it's really beautiful book. So, um, and then a book I read um, that came out last year. Um, it was a finalist for the National Book Award called Sorry by Laird Hunt. Um, it is, as you'll see, a slim historical novel, which um, I have a weakness for, but it's about a radium girl, you know, the girls that died, uh, painted the clock and the radium, um, unfortunately, was poisonous, but it covers a lifetime and it's very kind of the rhythm of the narrative is very much reflects the rhythm of life. And um, I just, it stayed with me. And then actually this was one that was on my list, Inheritors by uh, Asako Sar Sarazawa. And um, I, this is World War II fiction. It's kind of um, interconnected stories. And I will say, if you read this book, I didn't do this when I read it, so I was a little not lost, but um, there is kind of like a family, it, it kind of identifies the stories and the characters and how they're connected at the beginning of the book. But what I found really 
compelling is that it tells the World War II story from the Japanese perspective. And um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'll just say one other kind of World War II. Um, I read, I mentioned the Irish writer, um, Colm Toibin is one of my favorite writers and he published a book last year called The Magician, which is a fictional retelling of the writer Thomas Mann. And he was a German writer who won the Nobel Prize but it was really interesting to read about a German who has to flee his own country um, during the rise of Hitler. Um, so it's just interesting how, you know, yeah, it's just interesting. And I guess I, talking about that, it made me, I'm sure people have read in the news um, that the zoos in the Ukraine have actually experienced a lot of what happened in Belfast. So it's been kind of sad um, to see that kind of tragedy uh, reoccurring now. Again and again and again. Oh, wow. Made me think of that now. Oh. Um, any other books that you're recommending? I have my three. I was just going to. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, I guess, well, National Poetry Month. Um, I did oh. just pick up Ocean Bong's uh, new yes. poetry, um, Time is a Mother. And yeah, this is also another Austin writer um, seeking fortune elsewhere, Sadea uh, Bunau. And um, these are stories about um, characters from South India. And I really love the writer, another Irish writer, William Trevor. Um, he's mm -hmm. one of my favorite writers. And her stories kind of remind me of his work. Like there's a real simplicity and um, kind of, I don't know, just sort of humanity in her story. So that's called Seeking Fortune Elsewhere. I love the cover. Um, so, yeah. Nice. It is a pretty color cover. Yeah. So I only have three books for people. Um, I kind of, uh, this one, oh, you can't see it. I have to turn off my, just bear with me. I've got to turn off my my background in order for you to see the books. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so this is um, my book that um, I, I read this while I was um, traveling. Uh, it's called The Anomaly. And it was the wrong time to read this book because it's all about, it's, it's a little uh, sci-fi-y because what happens in this book is that a, a plane is flying in the air and then hits a hailstorm. Mm -hmm. And then what happens in this hailstorm, which is very violent and everyone's being tossed everywhere. But what happens is then all of a sudden there's bright sunshine, they get past the hailstorm, but now there are two identical planes, identical people, and, um, and one, um, lands in, I can't remember where, it was in America somewhere, maybe New Jersey. Um, anyway, it lands at the right time that it's supposed to land in March. But then that second plane with all identical people and all identical hail strike marks on the outside of the fuselage, that second plane lands in June. And the story is all about this gap in time and how do families reconcile now two fam you know, one family member coming back in two, you know, two forms and just that short amount of time that one is on ground and the other is not. And how do you deal with these two entities now? And, and, and it's a full plane. So you have over 300 doubles. Um, wow. So it's a very interesting, um, this one, a, uh, Goncourt Prize in France. It's an international bestseller. It's, this is a translation. The author is Harvey Letelier. And um, I, it was, I, I was so wanting to get back to it to understand what was happening to all these people. So um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a page turner, but you are all of a sudden like, what a wild phenomenon that has people have to figure out how to reconcile governments get involved and then as well as uh, individual people and children are all of a sudden looking at two fathers what is this talking about so it's an interesting book um 
the next one I read is called Mercy Street uh, by Jennifer Haight. Um, and this is, you know, no matter, I think no matter where you are in the, um, on the, the conversation about abortion, this is about um, a, an abortion clinic and just all the different people that are around an abortion clinic, including the, the, the protesters outside. And so you get a really interesting, it's, it's worthwhile to hear everyone's uh, conversation and to hear what's going on in people's minds and in their hearts. Um, and so if she does a really good job of just kind of bringing it into a conversation within yourself about this issue. So it's a, I think it's a really worthy book to read. Mercy Street by Jennifer Haight. And then this is, I did a program um, uh, made in China, maybe three months ago. Um, and this is an amazing, amazing book by Amelia Pang. If um, it is about, it's, it, it, the book is called Made in China. And it is about a woman. And this is a true, I mean, this is a nonfiction book. This is literally what happened. Amelia Pang is a investigative reporter. Um, and what started to happen is I'd say maybe five or six years ago, a woman uh, was opening up a Halloween decoration um, package ready to decorate her house and a note fell from the package and she picked it up and it was a note for help. It was an SOS letter from uh, the people in China who are in these uh, labor camps and are forced to work many hours and in terrible toxic conditions. And, and it was a, an SOS letter. And when um, the woman revealed it in their daily news, the investigative reporter then started doing research and found that there were many SOS letters being found mm -hmm. in decorations or, or other things that were coming from China. So she went to the one woman who initiated it and she found the person that wrote that letter. And, uh, and it's a very interesting uh, view from the inside of these labor camps. And uh, it's compelling. It's a really compelling read. It makes you think twice about purchasing things. You want to make sure what you're pur purchasing is not from one of these factories, these uh, internment labor camps, and why someone was um, interred in at all. He, uh, his was just that he had he had a different religious view, uh, and actually, it was to to be able to meditate. And he was thrown in jail. So it's a very, a very compelling read. I highly recommend it. I think book groups should read it because it would be incredible uh, discussion. So those are my recommendations. And we have five more minutes left. I, um, does anyone have any more questions for Kirk uh, about or any about her books? I see someone is saying, William Trevor is the best short story writer. <laughs> um, so does anyone else have anything else they'd like to, to ask? I will say about William Trevor that, um, well, this class I took with Yale Doctorow um, was called The Craft of Fiction. And basically he asked us to read his favorite writers and ask what we could steal from them. And he really taught us how to read um, and just like through the lens of craft. And there are a couple of sh short stories by William Trevor um, and then some short stories by Edward P. Jones um, and then Anthony Doerr that I read again and again as I was writing um, just to sort of learn how they uh, show character and scene and you know so reading I mean the thing that Dr. O really stressed to us is that reading is just as important as the writing piece that you have to read um like a professional writer you know it's they're both of equal weight so. wonderful well I think this concludes our our time with S. Kirk Walsh and her wonderful story about the elephant of Belfast. And I thank you all for uh, coming. Uh, we have another book chat next month. Uh, Goodrich Royce uh, is going to be 
uh, with us. She has written, um, gosh, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the um, title in the top of my head, but what's interesting is she used to be, Eric, she used to be an actress in New York City, a soap opera actress. She was the, the sister of Erica Kane. In, I guess that's all my children. I can't yeah. quite remember. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so she she's writing books now and she'll be with us next month um, at the book chat uh, talking about her book. And um, and that's I will be making that newsletter. I will send it out today or tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow is Good Friday. I will, I'll try and get it out today uh, with all of the book choices that we've talked about today. Thank you so much, Kurt, yeah. for being with Thank us. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. It. Yes, I'm so glad that to learn more about um, about the Belfast bombings. I mean, not that I wanted to learn about those terrible things, but just it was such a great human story. It was wonderful. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Bye-bye.